He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist who is now celebrating his 26th year in the business. And together, we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing conversation about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. We're back for another episode, Henry, and we are graced today by Claire Hassid. She is an account planner with about 25 years of experience. She's semi-retired, but I am grateful to her because she gave me some amazing insights that helped me write the, my second book, How to Write a Single-Minded Proposition. She's got some great stories, so let's join the conversation. All right, Henry, we're back with another episode, and I am really pleased to, to welcome to our show Claire Hassid, who has, for me, been a, a true inspiration. She is an account planner of some 25 years of experience, and I, she's going to tell us some great stories. But my connection to Claire is the fact that when I started doing research for my second book, how to Write a Single-Minded Proposition. Claire was probably the second or third interview that I had, and I talked with 30, 35 different people all around the planet. The, you know, the, the benefit of having the internet, and uh, we didn't have Zoom back then, but we weren't using it then, but I spoke with a lot of people that I connected with on LinkedIn, and I don't remember exactly how I found Claire, maybe she can remind us, but she gave me some insights that, really directed the the whole course of my second book on the single minor proposition. I've been grateful ever since. So she was not certain whether she she would have anything valuable to add to the Brief Brothers. And I happily changed her mind or she changed her mind or both of us. So I'm so grateful that she could join us. Welcome, Claire Hassett. Thank you for being Thank part you. of the Brief Brothers. Thank you. Well, Howard, what I can say to you is you're a good strategist because you did convince me <laughs> to come here you knew just what to say so okay but i i think i would like to start with the fact that i was a copywriter for 17 years and very successful but very miserable and um i said to my husband who was an ex-account guy and started at uh, doyle dane in the heyday knew bill birnbeck bill birnbeck okay. wanted him to be a copywriter and he said, uh, no, I think I'll stick with account work. And I said, the way I hear that story, it's as if God came down from heaven and said, here's what you should do for a living. And you said, no, I don't think so, God. Because <laughs> if Bill Birnbeck told me I should be a copywriter, you better believe the next day I'd be a copywriter. Oh, my goodness. But Stephen knew the business, and I told him I was really unhappy. Why? I said, I don't know. Everybody gets to travel. I end up in Long Island City. There's always the pad. The whole process is torturous. I'm not really a great writer. I'm more, I'm good with the strategy, but, you know, I never write on strategy, but my off strategy work always sells. So one day he calls me up and he said, get down here as fast as you can. Tell whoever you're in a meeting with, you have a family emergency. I get down there. It was the third strategic planning conference. There were 250 people in a room famous. I didn't know they were famous, but uh, they were famous. And I turned to him and I said, who are these people? This, this, they're like me. They're left brain, right brain. And he said, this is what you should be doing for a living. So we spent the next two years with my reading as much as I could and doing a new financial plan so that I could start at the bottom. Around what, around what period of time was this? I don't know. It might have been that's a very good question. I'd have to go back in year. It was decades ago. It might have been 2000. It was before 9-11. And uh, so the plan, so we had a strategy and the strategy was Saatchi fired people. I was working at Saatchi and Saatchi. They fired people like in October, you know, they clean house. So I went in and asked to be fired. <laughs> what? I said, you know, put me on the list if you wouldn't mind. Here's my plan. And um, I was basically told to go to hell. Get out of here and go to hell. Can I use language on this? Yeah, Shit, no. Okay. Shit, no, so, so the ex executive creative director comes into my office and says, what is this shit I hear about you wanting to go? What, what is the F is that about? I want to be a planner. What? 
and I said, look at everything on my coffee table. I had piles of books and magazines and and um, he turned around and he said, OK, I, I've talked to the account people. You're highly strategic. We think you'd be great. And we're going to put you in the research department. And, you know, it was I I'll tell you the end of the story. I ended up being very successful, solving a lot of problems, much more traveled the world, much more successful. But I'll tell you this one story. So I had to basically work 24 seven to learn how to present, to make argumentation, learn how to write PowerPoint, make, uh, it was a whole different skill set that I didn't, wasn't aware of when I went into it. And um, so I would be working there till one in the morning, you know, easily one in the morning. One day um, the president comes and said, I wanna see you. She said, I notice your timesheets. You're putting down that you work eight hours a day, but you're here till 11 and midnight. What's the deal? I said, well, you know, it's a new skill set. Yeah. I said, I don't want anyone to know how long it takes me to do my job. She couldn't stop laughing. She thought that was hysterical. She said, don't worry about it. <laughs> but that's how hard it was for me. And that was it. That was at Saatchi. That was at Saatchi. I mean, I had been at other agencies, but later on I found out that if you want to switch careers, it's better to switch careers within the field and preferably where you work because they know you. And I never had to cut, take the cut. And four years later, I ended up uh, being head of planning. But that's not really as interesting. I mean, that story is when you want to make a change in your life, make the change. Um, don't yeah. find out too much what it'll take <laughs> because you, you may not do it. Just dive in. The water is cold. You'll get used to it. I've, I've stolen uh, strategists or planners from account service before um, because you recognize right away when somebody's being underutilized um, right. in the, you know, on the business side, on the relationship side. I'm not saying it's not important. But strategy is such a unique skill set, and you said it, it's left brain and right brain, um, that when you see somebody that's doing really well, a young, really smart account person that could do strategy, I, I always try to grab them up as quickly as possible. I have seen, though, um, in my teaching, like at the Miami Ad School, I've had uh, creatives that have made the switch to strategy, although it seems more rare um, to me, um, but I, I definitely have seen that as well. Well, I actually called up John Steele before wow. I made, yeah, my husband was a, um, went from account work to being a uh, recruiter and he put me in touch with the best and the brightest, you know, it was a brand new thing in the United States. And, um, he, he said, sure, I think you could do it. And then Rita Clifton who was um, head of strategic planning at Saatchi UK, somebody said to me, you need to go to the mothership, go to Saatchi UK. So I went to the president of Saatchi and I said, how about if I spend my money going to the next strategic conference in the United States? I'll spend my money, they're offering a course, I'll spend money, my money on the course, would you send me to the UK? to get trained by Rita Clifton and they sent me. So here's the story. Here's an amazing story. They send me because my story is really, you know, I, Adam Morgan is really my uh, hero because Adam Morgan isn't, he evolves and he evolved to what does it take to sell the strategy? It's, you know, you can do the strategy, but how do you get it sold in? How do you get people believing in it? And what obstacles do you have to overcome? Because people come to a project, especially one that's been going around the block and hasn't worked. How do you break through? And the next story I'll tell you is about how I broke through. So they put me on an Olay uh, you know, Procter & Gamble Olay Skin Care in Canada. They send me to Canada and they say, this pro we haven't been able to sell this product for three years. Here's the short story. They told, apparently the product was very successful in the UK with the strategy and they had rules. 
And one of the rules was you couldn't use the word age. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, it's a product for 55 plus. So we don't want to see the word age in the brief or in any of the advertising. Anyway, we do the focus groups. And there's one and I didn't I ignored that. Of course, I had permission to ignore because they were failing for three years and I, I could be very bold and um, the creatives and I, you know, I believe you got to go to the creatives, you know, they're so instinctual and you've just got to go with them. And they were very frustrated and we start talking and I, we come up with this insight of age. Um, vitality has no age. Hmm. We go into focus groups. It's the one line where everybody leans forward. Now, if you were to listen to the scripts, what they say on the recording, what they say is not that different from concept to concept. It was they le they they leaned forward. And it was the leaning that forward. particular line, that particular line, they they went forward in their their body language changed. Mm -hmm. I had to actually have the film to show the client. So this is what I mean by you're a detective sometimes and you're an attorney making a case in front of a jury. So um here's what happened um this got back to london and all those brits and um the guy who assigned me to Olay on canada got called on the carpet and he calls me into his office and you've got a concept and it's got the word age and and i make the case and he went oh okay claire i'm going to stand behind you now this is my first project as a planner he's going to oh, stand nice. behind me i went into the bathroom and i threw up <laughs> because there was so much at stake and he was saying he believed in me and the end of the story was it was the highest scoring animation that had ever been done in PNG's history at that time. Wow. And um, it it was a real lesson in body language and in calmly uh, you know what we have what else have you tried you know what you're doing doesn't work and you're making rules. And this isn't about age, it's age, you know, vitality isn't an age, it's let me go. So that was my first um, experience of overcoming uh, rules. You know, Claire, that's interesting because our Henry and I did our first episode of the Brief Brothers in January of 2021. So we've been doing this a little over a year. And our first episode, we asked the question, what does it take to be a great brief writer? And I, Henry had a great answer. He, you know, he said, it's, it's writing. It's about being a good writer. My answer was right along what you just said. I said, we have to learn how to be good listeners, not just with our ears, but with our eyes. And you know, I've done training on, on creative brief writing where I'm talking with the, all the participants in the workshop and they are, their offices happen to be located. This is a, this is a resort park. I can't give you the name, but you would know, you would recognize it. Very famous. Um, and their office, an in-house ad agency, and they're right at, their offices are located right in the middle of the park. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out, okay, well, who really is our customer? And I said, you know, as we were going back and forth with some ideas, I just stopped and I said, guys, when was the last time any of you just got out of your offices, walked out the door and walked around the park and just... I mean, you don't have to interview them. You may not get any kind of legitimate or interesting answers, but just kind of watch. And they looked at me, I am maybe exaggerating a little bit, but they looked at me like, we can do that? <laughs> That's great. It just didn't occur to them to, you know, get out of their bubble. You know, Henry and I talk about this all the time. You know, where would you be, where's the best place to give a briefing? Well, sometimes it could be in the midst of where the product is sold or where it's used. How do you, how do you understand your audience Go and mingle amongst them. And here in your focus group, you're saying, well, if I hadn't been paying attention and noticed that they leaned in. Leaned in, right. And oh, that's how subtle is that? Well, that is the remarkable thing. Because it really was subtle unless that's what you were looking for. Right. What do you mean they leaned in, Claire? Like that, really, you can have me spend all these millions because six women <laughs> leaned in? Are you out of your mind? 
you know, yeah. and then you get labeled. Oh, and then you get labeled. Oh, well, she was a creative. You know, I, I mean, you get that because you're not necessarily uh, uh, taken seriously. So you have to make the argument in a very uh, cogent way. I mean, a, a lot of which when I looked at Adam Morgan, you know who Adam Morgan is? Adam Morgan is. Um, I confess my ignorance. Well, Adam Morgan and 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 John Steele essentially wrote the books on strategic planning. Uh, you know, John Steele had a strategy, which I don't it, it was for Canon, uh, giving it to his famous, giving it to creatives uh, so close. You can see the balls on a bee. <laughs> And yeah, I do remember reading that. Now, I know who John Steele is. I read his book when yeah, I was so first Adam Morgan, learning about briefs. Let me tell you about Adam Morgan. You should look him up on YouTube because right now, you know, he's got some he what he does is he moves through space. So the last thing that I noticed he did was about um, breaking through. Um, what is he, he, you know, breaking through people's barriers, believing that they can't solve problems. It's bigger than just a strategy. It's how do you get a whole group to think differently, think the way they really need to think. But he created a book about disruptive advertising, being disruptive. And, um, and just hearing him talk is incredibly um, inspiring. So I really want to, I'll give you an example. Not that this was his idea, but I believe it's important to go to conferences. If all you get is one idea at a conference, you got what you needed. And I'll, this is a real story. So I'm at this conference and I forget his name, but he too was like really up there when strategic planning came to the United States. And these were all Brits. And this is what he said. He said, if you're not selling work, if your client keeps killing work, you have to rethink who your target audience is because your target audience is probably your client, because if you can't sell them the work, you won't have a client anymore. And I, what? You know, to me, that was blasphemy. It was pandering. It was, no, the client, you know, this was my creative soul. No, the client should appreciate us and understand us. And what do they know? And here's this brilliant, respected, you know, among the top four of that day, Plan, if you don't have, a, you know, can't sell the work, then your target audience is the client. Okay, go back to the agency. We have the Tide account. Now, Tide, at that time, is P&G, responsible for 85% of revenue, and, you, and it was the linchpin to all of the other Procter & Gamble products we had, and, uh, and um, the creatives were all of a sudden in the last two years well-paid and respected, and they took all the hacks off the business. So here we are with some of the best creative talent and they can't sell anything. And I'm not, I'm just a beginning planner working on Olay. And I see the brief they have. And I say to the account person, this brief is shit. And she said, you think you can do better? I said, hell yes. Give me a meeting with the creatives. And I go up there with a whiteboard and I, and I absolutely pull what I hear in this conference. Hey guys, I hear you're on your fourth go round of creatives. I hear it's possible they could pull the account. Is that true? Yeah, it is. Wow. So maybe the target audience isn't women, blah, 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 to blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's this client. I, could he be the target audience? And they all go, yeah. So I go, so tell me what the target audience wants. And they start to tell me he wants a campaign about diversity. He wants a campaign that shows gay people and black people and single, you know, and oh, OK. All right. So he wants all these things. So could you do a campaign like that? Do you think I didn't even write a brief? <laughs> and, and all these cranky creatives and I was a cranky creative. I was a pain in the ass. So I understood it. And, that's, kind of, um, that's kind of redundant, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's true, Howard. <laughs> we can say that. We yes. can say that. Yeah, we love to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Who 
else has to jump? You know what the happiest day of my life was? When I had, I started as a strategist, I had to write a memo. I went home, I said to my husband, it was great. I sat down, I thought about the memo, I wrote the memo, I edited it, and I sent it out. <laughs> it didn't go through research. It didn't, didn't have to get approved. <laughs> How people didn't have to see it. It was like one of the most beautiful days of my life. <laughs> well, I'm still hanging on the edge of my seat here. What happened with the cranky creatives and the They do this campaign. They do this campaign. And um, the client buys it flat out. They go out there. He's almost saying yes before they can even finish <laughs> the thing. Okay. Now it gets produced. And P&G, all of the there, you know, the research, the name of the product would come in within the seventh to ninth uh, second. Nobody noticed, but the name of the product didn't come in until the 12th second. You didn't know what anybody was being sold until 12 seconds, almost halfway into the 30 seconds. So again, I'm getting sick, thinking this thing isn't going to fly. Okay, the research comes back. Now, whatever scores they got were great. But in the internals, when you read the verbatims, this is, this is a very interesting point about being a strategic planner and being a detective. Because, you know, clients, there are a lot of clients that are heat-seeking missiles looking to say no. <laughs> you know? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, I do. Look, I'm the hero. I stop that from happening. They don't know what they want, but they know what they don't want. And right. that's, yeah. oh, that's, good. that's good. Yeah. So um, all the internals said, this isn't like Tide advertising. This isn't Tide. This isn't what I expect from Tide. I, so the client starts to freak out. And I'm very conflicted because I don't understand it's getting these scores, but it's getting these verbatim. So I go back into the history books. And this is what I learned. And this is mind blowing. Tide has always been about families. And if you study the advertising, it's always been about families. And the campaigns come out and they work and then they start to fail somewhere around year five. Hmm. And then they put in a new campaign. And when you look at the verbatims, people say the same thing. That's not tied. OK, now what here's what happened. We had hired this literature professor from Harvard to be a planner. His name is Scott Carambas, brilliant young man. Somebody said to me, why don't you go to Harvard and try to find literature people and see if you can bring them in, you know, cold. Well, I mean, this guy was so smart. I, I literally trained him in three days and he was off and running. I kid you not. <laughs> so this is what he tells me. When I tell him this, he says, well, that makes sense. Now, let me see if I can say this clearly. He said, because when something begins and you're trying to capture reality, uh, like if you think of some cop shows that tried to capture reality back in the day, it looks like reality. Oh, that's really like, feels like a real cop station and what really happens, or that movie feels like it's not a movie, but then it actually becomes itself. After a while, it's like, oh, that's what a Tide commercial looks like. It's not reality anymore. Or that's what that movie technique looks like. It's not reality anymore. It becomes its own thing that's recognizable. And so you have to invent a fresh filmic way, not just words, but filmic way to capture reality. And Tide, through the years, to us, looks like Tide commercials. But when they first began, they just looked like something new and different. Hmm. Yep. And then they started to look like Tide commercials because they the were, best, yeah. The, the best analogy I could, you mentioned cop shows. You know, it's, it's funny, there was a sh cop show in the 90s called Homicide, Life in the Street. And they had a very unique, it was a very um, washed out, cinematography with kind of documentary type camera work where it's the shaky cam kind of like the office you know the office yeah, has that very yes and right. and 
it, it works and it's very unique in the beginning, but then it, that's the office. Like what you said, it just becomes, that's what it is, right? That's, it, you recognize it. Yeah. Well, that's what was happening with Tide Commerce. So going back into the research, going back what happened before, I was able to make the case to the client. Guess what? This is part of how you know you have a winning campaign. Let people that, get accustomed to it, right? Right, right. It's new and it's fresh. And no, it's not Tide advertising. But don't worry. <laughs> They'll be fine. They're going to keep buying Tide. Oh, here's another. I just got to tell you that Tide was fascinating. I didn't want to work on Tide. I had the opportunity to work on Gillette or on Tide. And I thought, Gillette, well, that's going to be a lot cooler than Tide. And I went to a senior planner there who was, his nickname was Yoda. <laughs> no pressure, huh? And I said to him, you know, what should I, he said, oh, Tide. You got Tide, it's detergent, it's Tide, it's old school. And he said, no, 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 it's, it's about families. It's a, the, the actual clothes represent people. It's very deep. What happens in the washing machines, like soup. It's it, all of the touch points. It is one of the most fascinating things you could ever work on. I didn't believe him, but I think if you're going to ask for somebody's advice, if you've chosen well, just do what they tell you to do. So I chose Yoda uh, at the agency. You know, he was thought of as Yoda, he's a brilliant man. And I, I didn't argue with him. I didn't really accept what he said, but I wanted his advice. He gave me his advice. I did what he told me to do. And we ended up doing award-winning uh, work. I mean, we did the first outdoor campaign that P&G had ever done. <laughs> I mean, I know this, I think it's kind of cool that it's about packaged goods because you think packaged goods can't be terribly amazing or exciting, but actually um, I worked with a great team. I worked with people who had been put on Tide for their talent and ability and willingness to try new things. Um, and so we did. And uh, so I go to this, so now it's year two, I go to another conference. <laughs> and I'm told, you know, you've got to go where the product is, the, you know, tie the product to the media. So I, um, and this is in the days when media people would hang out with creatives and strategic planner. So you had the whole team at six o'clock at night drinking cocktails. It was great, you know? And I said, what if we had print ads by the ice cream parlor? And it would say something about how, you know, the stain got on the ice cream and you can get it out. And they go, well, you know, we could actually do that. I go, you can? Really? They said, yeah, we, we could uh, do that. So, um, the, the creatives already had a campaign that was killed. Get this, because the graphics of it were too loud for print <laughs> on the page. Because <laughs> it was a huge Tide logo. It was, somebody at the client side considered it too loud. Mm. So um, we went to them, we said, what, what would you, th you know that campaign you have in your file? You think it could be, outdoor posters <laughs> and that's I love what, that I love that when an idea comes back with a vengeance I, I I worked on a project once uh for McDonald's and uh this project we we it was for the launch of a of a smoothie it was a flavor of smoothie and it, the client was super excited about it and we came up with a really beautiful commercial, but it was funny. The commercial was loaded with vignettes. And the funny thing was, I was probably the only person that realized it, but every vignette in the commercial was the main scene from another commercial that had been killed by the client. Like oh over the God. years, <laughs> over the years, there was like, there was a scene of the girl passing a note in, in class. There was a scene of, of a girl jumping in a puddle with her like galoshes on and uh, all of these different like scenes and the creative director brought them all back and put them in this one commercial and the client loved the commercial and but the creative director and I were laughing our asses off because this was oh. all things that had been rejected in the past. Yeah, well, you know, well, yeah. The, one of the things that I really like about you bringing the Tide uh, thinking and the Tide product up is that, you know, 
when we don't have a guest like you, Claire, we, we, Henry and I have a topic that we talk about related to creative briefs. And then we have a creative review. We pick a TV campaign or a print campaign or something and talk about it like Siskel and Ebert back in the day. And we have, and Henry reminds me, says, don't go after the big social justice cause of the month, flavor of the month. Let's pick a real product that people use every day because that's a huge challenge for any creative. So when you talk about doing a campaign for Tide and talking about the strategy behind Tide, that's nuts and bolts advertising. That's that's the the work that keeps the industry moving forward. It's the it's the I, I, I can't come up with a better term. It's the nuts and bolts of what yeah. we do for a it's, living. You know, packaged goods are the are the are the bread and butter of marketing and advertising. You know, you go to the grocery store. There's more than a hundred thousand SKUs th that are all crying to be seen. Well, and it's the, crazy, yeah. And the only <laughs> ones that you're going to see are the ones that you remember or that you have some sort of connection with, whether you're conscious of it or not. By the way, you know, like yes, you, right. You know, so well, uh, it for me, I I always like when I work with students. Um, you know, I I. I teach workshops on brief writing as well, but I do it just for fun. Like I, you know, like I had the Florida State University ad club and I, you know, and I do it for free for love of the game, but I always choose and we deconstruct uh, existing advertising and try to re retroactively write the brief for it. Oh, I love um, doing in, that. In, in the yeah. workshop, but I always pick like, you know, very quotidian, very, you know, run of the mill things that are advertised every day, like especially like on daytime TV, you know? Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of, of value in that because, you know, we see like these things in ad age and, and you know, in the pop culture that because they're outrageous or whatever, and they, they're like there for a minute and then they're gone. Um, and I prefer to like look at actual hard, you know, something that somebody's putting $20 million behind, you know? Yeah. Well, I have, I have, you know, you made me think about semiotics. And um, at one point I was, um, you know, I'm now head of planning at Saatchi and they're having problems with YoPlay. So I get, I get on YoPlay, which was uh, very interesting because the semiotics of YoPlay are fascinating. First of all, the cup is inverted. Right. So that means you start with a lot and you end up with a little at the bottom. And the other thing is it at, it had no uh, lid. And a little so foil. It, it foil. And what does that mean? Once you open it, it says you're not going to put it away. You're not going to put a lid on it and put it back. You're committed. You're com Yes, you're committed. I wish I had had that word. That would have really, I didn't have that when I was talking to the client. That's perfect. So you'd, uh, you'd be fun to, you guys would be a dream to work with. You make me want to like, what can we work on? <laughs> um, so uh, I do this whole workshop with the client and they, and the other thing, the other secret, there's always a little, a little secret of a brand. It's not really yogurt. Really? Plain. No. I've been eating it that no, stuff no, these no, years. No, no. It's, no, I'm talking about the code. I'm talking about the code of the product. They call it yogurt and they can sell it at yogurt, but that's not really what it is. And this is where, to me, strategic planning gets very interesting. What is the real code of the product? And the real code of the product is that it's adult pudding because it has so much sugar in it. Yes. <laughs> and it's an indulgent treat. And you can fool yourself that you're doing something healthy. Like Starbucks. Yes. So, it, right, exactly. So now, what is Dan? It's just coffee. It's not a chocolate milkshake. With... Right. It's not, it's not 600 <laughs> calories. You know that. It's not 600. So it's, a, anyway. it's a candy shop for adults. Oh, my God. So Yoplait is, is really pudding. Okay. And, and like pudding, it's incredibly sweet, but we're doling it out to you. We're giving you a, a six ounce cup and the minute you open it, it's big and it's there and it's luscious and you take your time and you put your feet up. Putting feet up in a commercial, I said to the creatives, the feet have to be up <laughs> on something. They thought I was crazy until I... So here's what happens. One day, 
the account people tell me they're coming out with big tubs of yo play. You know, Claire, like Dannon has the big tubs of Dannon. That's what they're going to do. I go, oh, oh, no, 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 no. They can't do that. They No, bad, really bad. Claire, calm down. What's wrong? I said, that will, well, how can I explain it? If you leave people to their own devices to eat as much yo play as they want, it's going to become sickening. And yeah. if you take away the cup, all right. So the count person says, and on, and on General Mills, you were never allowed to talk to the client, the brand manager, without an account person. But for some reason, they decided to send me into the lion's den. And they said, call him up and tell him. I said, what? Aren't you going to be on the phone? No, but we really think you should call and tell him. I don't think like, I want to do that. They're like, I, you, you want to say that? You go say that. <laughs> right, go say that. You want to deliver the bad news? <laughs> you, you go ahead. Here's his number. <laughs> so I go back in my office and I think, okay, now I've got to do something that I'm really bad at, a metaphor. I'm not really good at metaphors or examples. I'm not really good at that. But I, I sat down, I go, you got you to gotta figure this out. So I call him up. And I forget how I began the conversation because I was so scared. And, uh, you know, he's a bit like a big shot. And I wasn't used to big shots yet. I was used to, you know, just creatives and account people. And I, as I said to him, think about Hershey's chocolate. What do people love? The big bar or the little Hershey's kiss? <laughs> and you know what? He, he got it instantly. And this is what he did. It was brilliant. He found a way to get all the cups connected into a six pack. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So brilliant. So it maintained the identity of the single serve. This but is a bulk. treat. Uh, uh, but still the benefit for the client, which was some more of it, right? Because right. when they Selling sell the single yeah. the single serving, they might pick up two or three, but now all of a sudden you get six. You're you're selling more yo play in a six pack, which I what would I know? I don't know how they manufacture these things, but he knew. And, and they're universal now. There are a lot of companies that are doing it that way. Right. Not just not just your play. And it's 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 we're accustomed to seeing it in that kind of a quantity. We buy beer that way. We buy soda that way. We you know exactly. it's not it's not an unusual you know quantity. Or right. Way to buy it. Well, she's right. I mean, up to that point, right? Like you either got the little single serve or you got like the family size tub, right? But I think. There was some magic in the Yo Play brand, like as opposed to like the Dan. And so I guess yeah. that was the main competition, right? Like at that the, time, yes. The, yeah. I mean, the the yogurt category, by the way, is an interesting phenomenon. It's exploded, right? Like there's all these well, Greek. Uh, it, let me ask you something. What hasn't exploded? Cigarettes? <laughs> well, Vaping. But, no, but I mean, yeah, think about. Think about the proliferation of brands now and choices. It's so difficult to finally align yourself with a brand and a choice that to then go somewhere else, it, you know, it takes up mind space and it's stressful. And, uh, and, you know, you go to Costco and you're buying huge amounts of bulk. So you, you've now got 120 little cascade things in your dishwasher. Are you really ever going to switch to another brand? I mean, you know, it's just. Um, well, I mean, look at Tide. T Tide itself has got 50,000 different versions of Tide. You well, know, for, yeah, with, I mean. I, it's so I say to myself. With Febreze oh, and Oxy, whatever. Oh, oh, it's just, oh, you know. This is a story. There were people at Saatchi, young people, who didn't realize that P&G made both ivory dishwashing liquid and Dawn dishwashing liquid. What? Oh, I was going to ask you about this one. Yes. Tell yeah, us about they, this. They make, they make them both. So this is what happened. They got the bright idea to make a clear ivory dishwashing liquid. By the way, to make a brand clear in a clear bottle costs a fortune because you can't have any... What's the word I'm looking for? You know, you can't have any dust. You have to have a level of sanitation that's like making an Apple iPhone. 
So it costs an enormous amount of money to make something clear, but they wanted to differentiate. Okay. And then they tell me. And, and Ivory's kind of positioning has always been uh, purity, right? Like there's purity and cheap. It was, you know, the, the interesting thing about Ivory in its day was they did advertising that made it seem like it was a big, expensive brand. But when, you know, because of the production values and the casting and the messaging. But when you would go to the shelf, it was cheap. So you ended up feeling great. Like, look at me. I'm saving all this money, but I'm buying a brand that that help that, you know, feeds my ego. But there was kind of this uh, and I'm an ivory person. I love ivory, like bath soap. Um, that idea of it's just a white bar soap, 99 and 44, 100 right. percent pure, that pure. there's that there's a there's nothing else in it. There's, you know, it isn't fragrance. It isn't, you don't cut it. It doesn't have like green, you know, starbursts in, in the middle. It, you know, it's Irish so spring, not, eh? No it, Irish spring here for you. It's no. not trying no, too hard. It's not trying hard. Well, it, I'll never forget. It's just, it is what it is. It's soap. You know, it's funny you say that it is what it is because I was so brainwashed. I literally brainwashed myself. Because I worked on Tide, Cascade, and Ivory. They P and G. Oh, oh, I gotta tell you this non-strategy story. I ended up on a lot of P and G because I could solve the problems. Of course, I solved the problems by breaking a lot of rules. And I, I had to get off of it. You know, I had to work on something else. I go into the creative director and I this was when I was a creative, because I was a creative on Ivory and I was the strategic strategic planner later on. I said, I've got to work on something else. He said, I can't put you on anything else. I go, why? I've got, he said, you're, you're a Procter and Gamble uh, creative now. They have to have you on everything. You're, you're, you know, I'll give you more money, but I can't give you another account. <laughs> so I, the leave. Cage. I leave. Now I had been there so long. I had five weeks vacation. I go back in to see him two weeks later. I said, uh, you know, Stanley, I get five weeks vacation. Yeah. I said, would you agree what I do with my vacation is my own business? Yeah. I said, well, I want to take two weeks of those that vacation and I want to work on another brand. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> That was gutsy. That was gutsy. <laughs> and, and, he, and he called me two weeks later. And uh, he says, OK, I've got something for you and you don't have to take vacation time. <laughs> All right. Now, this is the horror. This is this is the this is the bad part of the story, but it has a happy ending. So I go into his just imagine what I've now put myself through to get an account. What does he give me? A douche. I'm not kidding you. It's like something out of fucking Mad Men. And I, and I keep a straight face. Something different. Here's something different. Yeah, here's douche. something different. Right. He Take your douche. douche which, which this creative had been working on. And now the account was about to walk out the door. And I said, OK, uh, this is what I need. And I need a, a, a freelance creative team. And then I need this other team. And I need an art director. I need three teams. OK, you've got them. I'm going on vacation. He goes on vacation. I put together a whole presentation, do this amazing work, break rules, broke rules. Nobody was allowed to break, but I come in, I break them, have an amazing meeting. He comes back from that because I hear you were amazing. You saved the account. I go, yeah, give me something. He gave me Hanes. I got Hanes. I got, I went from, I mean, you know, you, you, you have to figure out in life, in advertising, what is it going to take? to get it done. What what um, do I have to break through? Who, you know, how, what team member can I help? I mean, I remember the when I when I wanted to do this outdoor campaign and Procter and Gamble said we have to increase share on the West Coast and the East Coast. OK, so we do the outdoor campaign. But before we start, I'm brand new with these account people and they go, Oh, you know, we have a real problem with the research guy. And they tell me this this research guy is nerdy and they can't stand him. At the said, client? Yeah, yeah, at the client at PNG. I said, Yeah, but I bet he has all this information we need. Well, you go call him. <laughs> yeah, it's a theme. So <laughs> I go call him. 
And he is, he's a nerd, but I actually like nerds because they have, they're not necessarily socially adept, but they have so much information because that's what they do. They love the information and the facts. And that's what you need as a planner. You need the facts. Well, Claire, let me interrupt here because I want to back up a bit. You said that you nailed this. You, you, your boss went on vacation and you brought in these teams and you nailed this creative for an account that was about to walk out the door. And you said by breaking rules. Now, one of the things I know our listeners and our viewers are going to be interested in knowing is, especially those who are younger and are, they're, they're climbing the ladder, they're aspiring to be planners, or maybe they're even creatives and they're thinking about switching. Can you be specific about telling us one or two of these rules that you broke? Are these rules about creativity, rules about research, rules about planning, rules about presentation, all of the above? They're well, usually client taboos, right? Like for well, some reason that get handed down. Yeah. Here's, here's the easy part. The easy part, and I remember somebody said, stick to your knitting. So the first thing you just have to do is do the thing you're paid to do as a strategist in its purest form and anything any rule or anything anybody gives you write it down put it in an envelope and <laughs> stick it in some part of the agency that's not in your office i'm not kidding it's okay. like fine it's there i'm not i'm not paying any attention i'm going to do my job because you're paid to do your job and your job is to solve the problem. It begins with you. You'd be amazed. It really, you, you have to have a purity about what you do because you need to think of it as a calling. And it's a calling where you're saving jobs, you're making jobs. You have to think about it more than just, it's, uh, you know, you're working on a product. It's so much bigger than that. It's, it's capitalism with a capital C. And, yeah, and, it sounds and, like what you're saying is ask forgiveness, not permission. Yeah, and and then when you run up, you do what you do, and then you're, you know, when you run up against uh, the obstacle, uh, you have to figure out how you're going to push through that, and that is an art and a science in itself. To me, that's part of strategic planning, is how are you going to navigate the belief systems and um, the people? So, um, and you never know. I'll tell you with the outdoor campaign, he, we got money for six months, for it to run six months. After six months, the research guy calls me, who I now have a relationship with. He says, I have bad news and good news. So the bad news is it bombed. He said, but here's the good news. I think it needs three more months. This is what it's going to cost. I believe in this campaign. I'm going to take money out of my media account and give it to the brand people and have it run three more months. Three more months, it, it went above what the goal was. That was about a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to figure out, it's, it's, a much, it's as much a part of the job it are the relationships and the logic you need to use on people, your softness, your hardness. When do you be soft? When do you be hard? When do you say, gee, could you just think about this for a minute? Could you just open? I remember a client got very angry when we didn't come back with a change that they wanted. And I said to her, I want, I want you to know it's not easy to come back to you and not have made the change. It's, it's hard to come back and not make the change. It's easy to come back and do what you wanted us to do because then you'll be happy. But we didn't do what you wanted to do because we wanted to keep talking to you about it. Because we, we feel strongly about it. Because we, we have a reason. Right. Let's we reason, have a reason together. Right. Now, I mean, you have to be, you, you really do have to think about human relationships and how do you, open yourself and how do you be vulnerable as a planner? Mm. Um, it's, you're a psychologist, you're a detective, you're a lawyer. You, you have many different hats because at the end of the day, you want to sell in a strategy that people will really believe in. And sometimes you have to help them overcome their rules and their, you know, I remember an account person said to me, you've, Claire, 
you have to find a way to keep this concept alive. You can't keep fighting the client on it right now. Just keep it alive. I mean, uh, honestly, account people are a very interesting breed because they know how to keep the game going. Hmm. And uh, they can be pains in the asses like, you know, anybody in this crazy business. I mean, to do this for a living is insane, actually. But um, account people, really good account people know how to, you know, smooth the way. They know how to pick your moment. They're not right? just yes. They're not yes. Good account people aren't just yes people. Right. They, right. They, they're helping facilitate the process and they'll help you navigate those it, those yeah. waters. Yeah. You know, your your anecdote about not making the change, it reminded me I I I put a strategy in front of a client. And you know, sometimes there you, you have to learn a client over time. You can't like I had at the beginning with this client, like I could tell that I came in too much of a house on fire, right? Like I want right. and this guy is he's slower, he's more reserved, he needs to think about it, he needs to and I came in with a whole new idea um, and it kind of didn't go anywhere. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm having lunch with a former creative colleague of mine that I had worked with at another, we're just having a social lunch. And he calls me on the phone, the client calls me on the phone and he wants to talk about the strategy that I had presented to him like two weeks before. Something had happened in his organization that got him to thinking, Maybe he's right. Maybe this strat. And so I'm outside in the parking lot, like for half an hour, like re trying to sell in the strategy that suddenly he, it illuminated in his head. Oh, this is what he meant. And this is what. So I, there is that human side, right? About learning oh. the the other person's insecurities um, and learning to work around them and making them feel comfortable. Um, because nobody, you know, I, I jokingly, I posted this on, on LinkedIn and it's obviously a, a generalization and an exaggeration, but I said, the average agency person wants to win a lion at can the right. average client wants to send his kids to college. Right. That's great. Right. That's <laughs> right. Th th there's, there's a completely different objectives, it, it, you know, one person wants to get famous, do work that gets noticed, and the other person just wants to keep his head low and stay in the foxhole and not get his head shot off. Um, and so you have to learn how to, and as a strategist, you, you're really walking yeah. both sides, right? Because you want to go to can, um, but you also want your clients to be happy and feel comfortable and, and feel that they're doing something for the right reasons um, no, I, I ra rather than so just... Uh, yeah, I mean, I want them to sell products at the end of the day because the front, if you have pain at the front end, are you going to have pain at the back end? I'd rather have pain at the front end. Well, I, I, right. I believe yeah. I, I believe that the most insidious thing in, in the advertising business is the rounding off of the edges so mm -hmm. much that like each year yeah. you, you put out advertising that's less interesting the, then the bean counters come and they cut your budget by 10%. And so now you have less money to put less interesting advertising on the air. And it's a circular thing and you start circling the drain. And that's how huge number one billion dollar brands end up, you know, basically as yesterday's news and, and on, you know, on the bottom shelf of the grocery store. Yes. No argument. And the job gets harder and harder, which is why I think everybody needs more and more skill sets. There was a Harvard, the other thing I subscribed to was Harvard, the Harvard Business Review. And there was an article in there many, many years ago about profiling your clients. And then they gave you the words for each profile that they needed to hear to say yes to something. I also oh. hmm. bought the I'd be interested, yet. I have a couple of like publications from Harvard Business Review. I'd be interested in in reading that one because that that could well, be a I good Well, I actually I actually made a PowerPoint out of it. I also bought the book Getting to Yes, which was mm -hmm. a fascinating book on how you really negotiate. And it's wow. tiny. It's tiny. It's called Getting to Yes, and I actually negotiated the rights to the odd couple with the Neil Simon's lawyer using everything in that book. <laughs> wow. 
for what okay, for that's, what brand that's a great recommendation <laughs> for, for what brand was that this this was again for a tide commercial where i was using the odd couple um a high school play the odd couple with the same shirt got stained over and over again with spaghetti sauce and uh, i didn't i and um and i got this book um and I read it and I found Neil Simon's lawyer and I told the Saatchi attorney, I'm going to do the negotiating. And he went, you? I said, yeah, I'm going to get the rights to this. And I did. I got the rights, North America, 50,000. Yeah, for $50,000. And at one point he yelled at me and he said, creative artist says I'm crazy to even talk to you. I said, well, of course you're crazy to talk to me. I'm a copywriter. <laughs> I said, I thought story. you would look at this as you're walking down the street and there's $50,000 and you can either pick it up or leave it there. And I'm hoping you'll pick it up. And he said, you should come out. He, and he said, yes. And he, and he made the agreement. He said, you should come out to LA. I said, no, <laughs> then I'll just be another attorney. The reason you're even talking to me is because I'm the copywriter. <laughs> <laughs> so Claire, uh, one of the questions we, we sometimes ask our guests is there Thoughts on the state of the business. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about planning in, in particular and advertising in general? Well, I am optimistic because number one, I think that's the only way to live. And number two right. is um, it's through optimism, no matter how difficult anything gets, the really optimistic, energized young people find a way they find a way to break through and do something amazing. And that's always been the case. When I came into the business, I was told, oh, this is the worst business. All the fun, this is in 1970, I was told all the fun was over. What? Yeah. No, it wasn't. And it's not over now either. It's you, the smart ones, the clever ones find their way. And um, if anything, it's more exciting now. It's just different. But ideas are still ideas. Strategy is still strategy. All those things are still true. That's, that's, that's interesting, and I think that's refreshing. Uh, you know, when I talk to college students, one of the, and Henry and I have talked about this before, I've, I, the, one of the first questions I ask is, show me your hands. And how many of you call yourself capitalists? And how many do you suppose raise their hands? I don't know. How many? Two or three out of 20 or 25. I said, if, and because, you know, we say, you know, if you're not comfortable with the whole concept of capitalism, then advertising may not be your cup of tea because well, it is one of the biggest in right. drivers of capitalism and our economy out there. We, it's not just yeah. the. Well, you know, remember I said the word capitalism earlier. I know. And I felt yeah. I was saying a dirty word, but th no. that is what. That is the business we're in. But you, it is you also said, and and it's and it's funny, and I'm I'm gonna barge in, and because I, I, I gave a speech at the Miami Ad School a couple of years ago, and it's I call it pontifications of an ad agency veteran, and the first pontification is if you don't if you don't uh, like capitalism, this business probably isn't for you, and I go specifically into this, but in that uh, pontification. I give a quote that you reminded me of is a, a Argentinian creative director, but he's world renowned. And he gave an anecdote. It was like on the 30th anniversary or the 40th anniversary of his entry, having entered the ad business. He gave this anecdote on Facebook about how he had gone to the Nestle ice cream plant in Argentina. They were there for a meeting with the client and the head of the plant came over and asked, who's the creative here? And uh, he raised his hand and he said, come with me. And he took him into the room where they make the ice cream. And he said, we have one shift of workers here making the product. If you make a good campaign, we can add a second shift. Well, says, yeah. And if, and, if you, and if you make a great campaign, we'll have three shifts here working and you're going to feed a lot of people's families and you're going to provide a lot of benefit to a lot of people. And you said it earlier, you said, this is about making jobs, about saving jobs. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. the way I wrap up my pontification to the students is, listen, market economy is nothing more than people voluntarily making things and other people voluntarily buying them. I have no problem being a part of a system in which everybody's doing things voluntarily. 
and helping people mm -hmm. find products to to choose to buy. I sleep very well at night, so um, I you know I agree. And I and I but your your point about making jobs and saving jobs to me that I, I immediately thought of that. I love your story. I mm -hmm. love it. Yeah. It's going to be among my most favorite stories. Thank you for sharing that. It was really yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I don't know where you've been hiding that one, Henry. That's a, that is a great story. It reminded me of a creative director that I worked for in Minneapolis who had a much more micro version of that, but he because he wasn't specific. But that is the true point. There are so many people besides us creatives and planners and account people and clients who are affected by what we do. And it's not, I don't mean the people who make the commercials. I don't mean the people who, who print the magazines. It's the people who make the product. And They're distribute it. And distribute it. And sell it. All those things. That they, these are contributing to our, our livelihoods or making our livelihoods much better, making our lives much better. I mean, whether you're selling ice cream or Gillette or Tide, this is stuff we need, right? Are things over-commercialized sometimes? Yes. Do oh, companies yeah. um, engage in excesses? Yes. But the, what's the alternative? The alternative having no choices, no freedom, no, you know, working on, you know, working, buying whatever it is that they give you because that's all there is. Um, you know, I, I, I like that. I, I, I paraphrase Winston Churchill, who said, or I paraphrase Winston Churchill by saying, capitalism is the worst form of economy except for all the others. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and in all of that that's overblown, there's room for like a brand like Method. Of course. Right. So, you know, that's what happens when everything becomes somebody steps in and says, OK, it's overheated. There's an opportunity. Which is the flip side, by the way, of one of the, one of my pet peeves is now every company in the last five years has been scrambling to find some greater given purpose like of saving humanity. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, and, don't and, get and, me started. And so, that. like, I, I'm a big believer in it. So if you make a good widget. And it's a good widget. That's good enough. Like people need it. People want it. They buy it. It's good enough. It doesn't have to save the world. It's just a good <laughs> widget. And and um, and part of it is consumers get jaded. And when they when everybody's claiming they're saving the world, consumers say nobody's saving the world. And it, the only people are really damages is, is the brands that really do good, like the. Brands like Tom's Shoes, that's a great brand, right? Like they, right. you buy a that's pair of nice. shoes, a pair of shoes goes uh, to somebody who doesn't have a pair of shoes. But when everybody is claiming and putting on the mantle of being world saviors, then nobody really is. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's the fight I used to have about not every brand has to be at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. all have to be about self-actualization. Sometimes it's just get the stain out of the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I need to go to the office tomorrow and I can't have this mark on my... Right. right. I, I, so, uh, so Claire, as we wrap things up, any last bit of advice that you would offer to, um, to, to new and veteran strategists and brief writers? Well, I guess if I was in still in the business, I'm always looking for the people who can inspire me. Uh, honestly, that's find those people that inspire you. They're out there. For me, it was John Steele. It was Adam Morgan. It's still Adam Morgan. Um, because you need people to lift you up and make you think differently or make you feel like, yeah, I am doing the right thing. Because, you know, all kinds of work is difficult. All kinds of work. We all need people who will inspire us. And so, um, uh, and, and I would also say, uh, never retire, repurpose. <laughs> never, ever retire. I, I'm like working in, I work in a little community called Forest Hills Gardens, and I'm now on the board of directors, and I'm chair of communications, and find another purpose in life. Never, ever retire. Well, Claire Hassett, thank you for being an inspiration. Thank you. We thank really appreciate you. your insights. You told us some amazing, great stories, um, and we appreciate your presence. Thank you so much for being well, I uh, appreciate uh, your uh, inviting me. Thank you. You guys are the best. Thank All right. you. Take, Take care. care. All right. Bye-bye. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Eibach, and together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Ha <laughs> ha.